Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I have to tell you um, that I, I just am always amazed at the way that God works. So for those who don't know, I just got back on um, th Wednesday? Wednesday from a, a 13 or 14 day trip to the Holy Land. And um, this past week, I was trying to pay attention to, um, to what I was supposed to be preaching on this week, so I looked it up on Monday and realized how perfect the passage that we had picked out like seven months ago was for my very first Sunday back. It could not have, God could not have picked a better scripture passage for me to preach on this week because my favorite place that we went the whole time we were there was to be on the Sea of Galilee. We got to take a boat ride. And, um, and the people running the boat clearly know their audience because we weren't on the boat five minutes when they started playing the Star Spangled Banner and they even hoisted up an American flag onto, and then played, um, oh, what was the song they played? I don't know. They played a hymn that all of us knew and we sang along. So I wanted to just show you a couple of things from our trip as we begin um, to talk about the scripture passages from this morning. This is a picture of a 2,000-year-old boat that they have named the Ancient Boat. Isn't that a great name for it? That's all they call it, the Ancient Boat. It was founded in 1986 by two brothers who were um, fishermen on the Sea of Galilee and amateur archaeologists. They happened to be lock walking along the shore long shoreline one day um, during a severe drought that had resulted in low waters and they saw just a piece of the boat sticking out. The boat had been buried in and protected by the seabed sediments for, over, for 2,000 years when they found it. The boat is about 26.9 um, feet long. It's 7.5 feet wide and um, 3.9 feet tall. The archaeologists who have studied and, um, and put this boat in the museum and protected it can tell that the boat has had a very long work life because of all the repairs that have happened to various pieces of it. They found 12 types of wood evident in the hull, which showed them that it had had lots of repair work done to it over its lifetime. They have dated this um, boat to be either the first, um, between the first century before Christ and the first century after Christ. And somewhere in there, the boat was used for a very long time. And they believe, because of the crew size, that this is the type of boat referred to in the Gospels as those our fishermen in today's lesson probably would have used. It's an amazing. You can't take pictures with... Um, with a flash because you have to protect the boat. So they're not the greatest pictures, but it's pretty amazing to see it. One of the phrases our guide, Sana used a lot during our trip was, let's situate ourselves. She said that about 18 million times as we were traveling. And what she meant by that was, let's understand where we are and what's around us. We got lots of geography lessons, which was good because I have never been good at geography. So this morning, we're going to start by situating ourselves with the setting of our gospel lesson, which as Mark says, is in Galilee near the sea. Now, we have a, a map here, and what you need to know is that Galilee is not a specific place. It's a region. It's kind of like saying Jesus was in Baltimore County, right? It gives you a sense of the region. So Galilee are all of the towns that were around the Sea of Galilee, which you can see up at the top in between the red lines. So Tiberias, Capernaum, all of those were towns right around the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus was somewhere in Galilee. He had come to Galilee after being baptized down at the Jordan River to begin his ministry. Ministry. And this region is where a large percentage of Jesus' ministry occurs. In our lesson, it says, as he was passing the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew. He really could have been passing the sea in any number of places. But I wanted to show you a couple pictures of the Sea of Galilee. So we're going to scroll through some um, as I continue my sermon. The Sea of Galilee, also known as uh, Kinneret or the Lake of Gennesaret, is the largest freshwater lake in Israel. It is about 13 miles long and 8.1 miles wide and has a circumference of 33 miles. It is the lowest freshwater lake on earth at between 686 to 705 feet below sea level. Um, and it, it is the, the second lowest um, sea on earth. The Dead Sea is lower than, um, than the Sea of Galilee. 
Now, in my humble opinion, I think it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. It was my favorite thing that we visited. And it is not at all what I pictured for all of these years when I've been reading gospel lessons set by the Sea of Galilee. What I didn't know about the sea before I took a ride in, on it is that there is nowhere on the Sea of Galilee where you cannot see the shore all around you. It's that small. I had always in my head, I guess, pictured it more like an ocean or the Chesapeake Bay where I grew up, so that sometimes you could see land, but sometimes you couldn't. But it isn't like that at all. It's very small. I also didn't realize how windy it is in this region. The wind just whips right through you, even when the sea itself seems calm, like it was when we were on the boat. The wind was ferocious. So it is to this beautiful vista that Jesus comes during our lesson from Mark. We know from the first verse of our passage that Jesus had come to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. So repent and believe in the good news. So maybe Simon, Andrew, James, and John had heard this good news already. Maybe they had heard Jesus proclaiming it as he came around the region. It is a small place, and so I have to believe that news travels fast in a place like that. In any case, Jesus comes to the Sea of Galilee, and he sees Simon and Andrew casting nets into the sea in a boat much like the one we saw a few moments ago. And he says to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. What a line, right? I mean, the screenwriters could not have written a better one. Now, if I were Simon or Andrew, I would have had a few questions. Jesus and I would have had a discussion. I would have asked for some clarification on a few things, maybe what we were going to be doing and how long we were going to be gone. But the Gospel of Mark tells us that Simon and Andrew immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, the gospel writer really likes that word immediately. He uses it a lot in the gospel of Mark. And then Jesus comes to James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who are mending their nets, and calls them. We're not told what he says to them. And again, they follow with no discussion or question. Now, Mark is the shortest of our four Gospels, and he tends only to share details that he thinks are really important for you to know about Jesus, which maybe is why he leaves out the conversation or doubts or concerns of the disciples. He only shares that they immediately leave, because it's not the convincing part that is important. It is their act of faith in following this man named Jesus that is important to him. They couldn't have known completely what would happen. Three years later, the gospel writers tell us that they still didn't completely get who this man Jesus was or half of the things he did or said. And yet, they continued to follow him. I was doing some research this week, and according to the latest Bureau of Labor Statistics data, there were a, a total of 4,405 fatal work injuries recorded in the U.S. in 2013. Let me just give you the top 10 most dangerous jobs you could have. Construction, electrical power line installers and repairers, farmers, ranchers, and agricultural managers, truck drivers and sales drivers. That includes like takeout, pizza deliverers, and commercial laundry vehicles, all ranked in the same category. Mining machine operators, refuse and recyclable collectors, roofers, aircraft pilots, and flight engineers, fishers and related fishing workers, and logging workers. What's interesting about this top 10 list is that it's the exact same list from 10 years ago when I used this statistic for another sermon. They haven't changed in 10 years. Now I think to this list we've got to add two categories. I think two more really dangerous jobs to have are the 12 disciples and a biblical prophet. We know from tradition that all but two of the disciples called by Jesus would later be killed because of their belief in Christ and their decision to follow him. We leave out Judas, who committed suicide, and John, who tradition holds, um, lived a long life and died of old age. So being an apostle is certainly in the top ten list of dangerous jobs in the Bible. And next to that would be being a prophet. No more, I don't think there's any more dangerous job in the Bible than being a prophet. They frequently got killed as they spoke truth to power and as they proclaimed God's word to people who really didn't want to hear what God had to say to them. 
The character in the lesson that Dottie read from us from the Old Testament certainly knew the dangers of being a prophet. And it's for that reason that he was far less than enthusiastic when God first called him to go to Nineveh. God says to him, here is your mission. Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Can I just say as an aside, it struck me as I was listening to Dottie read it, twice it calls Nineveh a great city, and yet it was full of wicked people that had to repent. I think that's interesting that uh, God named it as a great city, even against their wickedness. He could see what the good inside of that. That just has nothing to do with the rest of my sermon. I just thought it was interesting. So, it had to have sounded like an impossible mission to Jonah, right? He's being sent to the capital of Assyria, a powerful enemy of Israel who would uh, overtake them many times in Israel's history, and he's being asked to preach against it. He doesn't want to go because he knew it was dangerous and because he thought the Ninevites deserved something other than that. They didn't deserve the chance to repent. So he pouts and he frets, and finally, as Dottie told us, he bolts in the opposite direction. He takes off for Tarshish in an effort to escape the presence of God. He hops on a boat, encounters a storm, is thrown overboard after he tells the crew that he's running from God, and is swallowed by that famous fish. After praying and repenting for three days, God, the word of God finally comes to him again, and he is spewed out on dry land. And God says to him again, get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So this time Jonah goes, probably still smelling a little fishy because who wouldn't after three days in the belly of a fish. He enters the city and walks for a whole day, making his way just a third of the distance across this daunting and dangerous city. Forty days more and Nineveh will be overthrown, he shouts at them. This stinking, sticky prophet cries out against the 120,000 residents of an enormous and powerful city, not knowing if they will hear him and heed him or just tear him to pieces. Now, to everyone's surprise, at the end of the book of Jonah, the Ninevites believe in God and they repent of their sin. They proclaim a fast and they put on sackcloth, both the young and the old. And even the king of Nineveh rises from his throne, removes his robe, covers himself in sackcloth, sits in ashes to repent. And he calls everyone in the city to turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. And when God sees what they do, scripture tells us he changes his mind mind. They don't die, they live. Now there are certainly a lot of lessons to be learned from Jonah and from the disciples' willingness to follow Jesus. And one of those lessons that I believe we need to hear is that truly following Christ will take us out of our comfort zones. The disciples had to leave their homes and their jobs and their families and their lives to follow Christ, and it changed everything for them. He reinterpreted the scriptures for them numerous times and took them out of what they had been taught about God their entire lives. Sometimes we also have to leave our comfort zones. We have to leave what we know of life and love, of faith, and begin to let Jesus work new things in us. I have wondered if there were other people along the way who had the choice to follow Jesus like the disciples and didn't. And I wonder what they thought afterwards. I know in my own personal life, I ran, much like Jonah did, from God's call in my life. I wanted my plan, and I wanted to stay where I was comfortable. But the longer I ran, the more uncomfortable I became with my own comfort zone. There is a message for us in both of these stories. And I don't think it has anything to do with how dangerous our work world occupation may be, but instead with how dangerous it can be when in the service of a sovereign God. Dangerous, however, only if we come to God with preconceived notions about how God is supposed to function and operate within our life. If we put Jonah up against Mark's story of the disciples, we can see a huge difference, right? In Mark, Jesus called, and as Mark says, immediately the disciples followed. In Jonah's story, he ran. He ran because he didn't like God's plans, because he had other ideas about what what should have happened to the Ninevites. He had his own agenda. 
So here's the second lesson for us. If we volunteer to serve God with our own agenda, our own job description, our own outcome statement of what will happen in our hands, we're setting ourselves up for powerful disappointment because the awesome and amazing and wonderful thing about God is that he doesn't work the way that we do. And we should be thankful for that. Following God can be dangerous work, but it is also rewarding. It is the most rewarding thing you will ever do. It's dangerous because we might be laughed at. It's dangerous because we might be misunderstood, because we will have to put the interests of others ahead of our own. It's dangerous because we can't be sure what God will ask of us. It's dangerous because being obedient doesn't always come naturally to us. It's dangerous because we will be asked to turn the other cheek, we will be asked to love our enemies. We will be asked to be a peacemaker. It's dangerous because we will be asked to pray for those who despitefully use us. But if, like Simon and Andrew, like James and like John, we can leave our nets and follow Christ, our lives and the lives of all of those around us will be changed for the better because we will come to know the Savior. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.